The Spitfire is widely regarded as one of the finest fighter aircraft in history. Serving throughout the Second World War and proving adaptable enough to evolve as the conflict raged, the Spitfire was a keystone aircraft in British and Allied air forces and was built in large numbers. As a result of this wide-scale construction and usage, the type found itself also used in a host of other roles other than as a fighter as originally intended. Photo reconnaissance, meteorological, carrier fighter, attack bomber. If a single seat aircraft could do it, then the Spitfire probably did. Heck, they were even used to transport beer to thirsty troops fighting in Europe at one point. And there was one other role, less well known of, that the aircraft was tried in. One which is somewhat ironic, as the lineage of the Spitfire runs directly from the supermarine racing floatplanes of the pre-war years. The Floatplane Spitfire. Interest in the concept of having a seaplane variant of the Spitfire started with the German invasion of Norway on the 3rd of April 1940. Both the British and the French rushed troops to the country to confront the Germans, and one of the major issues faced by the Allies was the lack of airfields for them to operate fighters from. But what Norway did have was miles of open waterways and fjords from which seaplanes could operate. The British had in fact planned to build a floatplane variant of the Blackburn Rock before the war. But this turret fighter was barely a functioning combatant in its original configuration, and the addition of heavy floats made it even more of a sitting duck. As an aside, I've done a video on the Rock, so check that out if you want to know more about that aircraft. Anyway, with nothing else suitable, the British decided that the best stopgap option was to see if they could convert one of their existing frontline fighters into a viable combat floatplane. Both Supermarine and Hawker were asked to examine the possibility of this with their respective Spitfire and Hurricane fighters, building test aircraft into floatplane configuration as a matter of utmost priority. To this end, the government released several sets of floats that had been built for rocks for trial fitting, with the understanding that should they prove successful, 50 more sets would be made available to build floatplane fighters. Hawker was dubious about whether the conversion would work on the Hurricane effectively, especially as the Rock was a heavier aircraft than both the Spitfire and the Hurricane, and thus the floats designed for it were heavier and larger than needed to be. As the Hurricane already had inferior performance to the Spitfire, no doubt they appreciated that, at a time when they were already working flat out, the exercise for them would prove a waste of effort. A scale model test conducted at the Royal Aircraft Establishment at Farnborough would go on to prove this, demonstrating that the Hurricane would be liable to suffer water damage as a floatplane. The Spitfire, however, was deemed safe for actual conversion, and so Supermarine tasked the Folland Aircraft Company with doing the conversion for them. For this, a single Spitfire Mark I, serial number R6722, was provided. Folland rapidly got on with the job, and by the first week of June, R6722 was ready for flotation and taxi trials. These didn't go so well, and the aircraft, which acquired the derogatory nickname of Narvik Nightmare, was found to be very unstable in the water. Of course, the rapid and lash-up nature of the project makes this hardly surprising, and probably with more time, better results would have been accomplished. But while the floatplane project was proceeding rapidly, the war was moving even quicker. On the 24th of May 1940, the withdrawal of Allied troops from Norway was approved, and France itself was collapsing to the German attack that had started two weeks before. Within a month, the British had been driven off the continent, and France had surrendered. Now, instead of needing aircraft for offensive operations, the RAF needed every fighter it could get for home defence, and R6722 was rapidly converted back to her original configuration and posted to a combat squadron. But this didn't mark the end of the saga of the floatplane Spitfire, far from it. In June 1941, the RAE was asked to once again look at the possibility and ran some model tests. Now the proposed aircraft for use was the Spitfire Mark III, which was expected to become the new main variant, and the RAE spent a few months working on the original test data and designing new float designs. But this too fizzled out by October of that year, and once again the idea was shelved. And then Japan attacked Pearl Harbor and launched their campaign to take over the Pacific in December 1941, and the possible need for a capable floatplane fighter arose again. This time a Mark V-B was used, W3760. This aircraft had as its standard armament fit two 20mm cannon and four 303 Browning machine guns, and instead of being lumbered with whatever floats happened to be on hand, 
This time, these components were expressly designed for purpose by Arthur Shervel of Supermarine. He had designed the floats for the original Schneider Trophy racers, from which the Spitfire had evolved. W3760 was also given several additional modifications that the previous work had shown would be necessary. A ventral stabilising fin, larger rudder, a strengthened wing spar, and a four-bladed propeller. The conversion was completed by the latter half of 1942, and the aircraft was put through its paces in October of that year. There was a brief spell of excitement during these tests when one of the pilots, straying from the designated safe passage flight corridors, was engaged by the anti-aircraft defences of the city of Southampton, but fortunately he was able to evade and return to base safely. The aircraft then went for service trials in Scotland, but the floats proved to have issues with cracking and taking on water, and new ones had to be made for proper service trials to take place. These showed that even with the additional drag and weight of the floats, W3760 could make a top speed of 324 miles per hour. While this was 40 miles per hour slower than the stock Mark V, this was still considered acceptable. Surprisingly, the test pilots reported that the float Spitfire seemed to retain the manoeuvrability of the original fighter, and encouraged by this, orders were given to Folland to convert two new Mark Vs, serial numbers EP754 and EP951, into float planes. This was quickly achieved, and these two aircraft, with newer Merlin 46 engines, demonstrated top speeds of 331 miles per hour. Now with three of the fighters on hand, the RAF decided that they might have a suitable operation for them to take part in. With the recent defeat of Axis forces in North Africa, which had occurred in May 1943, the British had launched an operation in September to seize the Greek Dodecanese Islands, which are scattered off the coast of Turkey. The surrender of Italy, whose troops formed a large part of the garrison on the islands, gave the British the opportunity to launch an attack to try and take the whole chain. German garrisons there were largely reliant on air transportation to stay supplied, and the RAF thought that they could use Spitfire floatplanes to attack them and disrupt German logistics. The idea was that the aircraft could hide amongst the many small islands in the area and use a submarine as a base. So in October, the three Mark V floatplanes were dispatched to Egypt to undergo training and prepare for the operation. Based at an RAF flying boat station on the Great Bitter Lakes, the aircraft began working up for their mission but hit a snag when it was found that W3760 was suffering from severe corrosion to her rear fuselage. Indeed, the saltwater of the lakes was not exactly ideal for the aircraft, but by November the mission was scrubbed anyway, because the Germans, acting with great decisiveness, defeated the British invasion. Apparently some thought was then given to sending the Mark Vs to the Pacific, where they may have found some use. But eventually, it was thought that something better could be done, and the three Mark Vs would ultimately be scrapped in 1944 due to the corrosion they were suffering from. The something better was in fact a fresh conversion. Still thinking that such Spitfire floatplanes might be useful in the Pacific, in the spring of 1944, an order was placed to convert a fresh Spitfire, this time a Mark IX, serial number MJ892. By July, the aircraft was ready for testing, which took place at the Saunders Row factory in Beaumaris, Wales. The Mark IX float also encountered many of the same problems that had been found with the early models, plus some new ones. The air inlet would often ingest water on takeoff, causing the engine to cut out, plus the aircraft, with a more powerful engine, tended to perform what is described as a waddle when taxiing. However, the conversion was successful, and MJ892 proved to be the fastest of the floatplane Spitfires, recording a top speed of 377 miles per hour. But again, the war had moved on, and the need for such an aircraft didn't really justify any major production orders. The Mark IX was used for testing for a few months, and then was either scrapped or converted back to standard land configuration at the end of the war. And that is the story of the floatplane Spitfires. Another interesting concept that never quite got its timing right.